All right, Brokers of Better Facebook community. We have uh, Phil Shoemaker, President of Originations at HomePoint Financial here. Um, we have a lot of subjects to cover. Um, uh, we are going to try to stay as as relevant with the information as possible since uh, we've, we've done interviews recently covering things from margin calls to servicing valuations um, and, and all the different things that are impacting independent mortgage bankers. But we got a whole bunch of new subjects and topics that um, have been headlines here on Inside Mortgage Finance and uh, Housing Wire. And it's 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 pretty much the, the top pressing issue at the, at the moment seems to be all around government lending and, and what Ginny May is doing to you know provide liquidity to the market, provide liquidity to servicers. So Phil, how are you? How are you holding up? Oh man, I'm uh I'm holding up. Get, getting a little uh, little stir crazy, but uh, you know. <laughs> so we're gonna how get right. You? Oh, you're, wait, can you hear me? I see. Yeah, I can hear you. All right, good. Uh, so we're gonna get started here. First thing is on Friday, Ginny May came out very late in the day um, with the pass through assistance program announcement, um, and basically that announcement uh, detailed that they're gonna be offering servicers uh, that are facing major liquidity issues on on Ginny May Securities. Uh, the ability through this pass-through assistance program to get advanced um, the PNI payments that uh, any consumer that's going into a forbearance agreement or default would normally pay. The market reaction was, okay, great. I think this is going to resolve all of our government lending issues. I think um, there's really two government lending issues here. One is the servicer's immediate uh you know, cash flow uh, and liquidity issue uh, related to existing exposure of uh, Ginnie Mae loans. And then the other one is, you know, what is the appetite of uh, servicers and buyers in the MBS market when it comes to these securities? So what are your thoughts and what are your feedback on that program announcement? I mean, it's a it's a step forward. You know, it's, a, it's definitely moving the right direction. I think that that uh, of the next couple of weeks, um, all of the servicers will be looking for a little more clarity. Like it's not entirely sure. Um, is that just P&I? Is that going to cover the, the T&I component of it? Um, but it is good news. I will, I will say that because if you, if you look at, you know, I kind of, I kind of think about this, um, what we're going to go through over the next six to you know 18 months in, in really two phases. There's the, there's the most immediate phase, which is um, this flood of requests that all servicers are getting by their borrowers to, to go into some type of forbearance uh, program. Um, to give you a sense, like I'll give you some of our numbers. I mean, we we posted a website and within um, to, to help facilitate this because there's just no there's no call center on the face of the planet that can handle the volume of calls that are coming in. And so we posted a website uh, to help handle these requests. And literally within like three days, we're we're pushing you know six seven thousand requests for borrowers to go into to forbearance. And so there was rightfully so by many of the servicers a massive amount of concern around the cash component, you know the cash risk associated with that because you know before the Jenny May announcement, you know uh, servicers would have had to have advanced that cash, the P and I and the T and I component, uh, irrespective of the borrower making the payments. And so it. It helps, but I think where, where you know where there needs to be more clarity is what does this really mean long term? And, it, and it's it's more than just Ginny May. It, it really speaks to the overall risk around government lending in general um, for the foreseeable future. Because all right, after forbearance, which is kind of the next phase of this whole thing, you know, I think that this is something, Anthony. I think that in everyone listening, that, that everyone can help with. There is a common misconception out there. I think it's been it's been driven by the media. It's been driven by you know local local governments that, hey, if you stop making your payments, you don't ever have to make that payment. And, and the reality is that's not the way forbearance works, right? You say, yeah. So the way it works is whatever the period of time is, you're not making that payment. But the minute that forbearance period is up, now all of a sudden the borrower has to catch up on all the payments they've, they've missed. And so if you really think that through, the next phase of this is going to be, there's going to be a large percentage of um, of borrowers that go some form of default and they're going to need another level of assistance either in the form of modifications and you know things that we can help them get through um the reality of a you know I don't know what the most recent announcement was but i think it's like we're pushing 30 some percent unemployment um yeah. and so that's kind of i think the the larger issue that, that people are trying to deal with around government lending is what is in a in a, an environment where there's 32 percent unemployment uh, you know, it's great that Jenny says they're going to help us out on the forbearance side for a period of time. But what does it mean when default rates spike and you're dealing with this over a very long period of time? 
um, you know, and, and how, what kind of assistance will be, you know, will be available to service for, for that, because that could be, that could be a massive, um, a massive amount of, uh, of cash flow. Yeah, I, I think, I think that's one of the misperceptions that I, I'm seeing out there is number one, um, a lot of people are looking at this issue as a one dimensional issue when it comes to, Hey, Ginny, Ginny made this announcement and now this is going to be the end all be all. But the, the truth of the matter is when, when you guys buy servicing, you're, you, you're, you hold and retain servicing, you're buying it with the expectation that people are going to pay and it's going to be profitable. I think right now people have to understand that what, what, what is happening is this is a short term loan or a short term um, kind of window of facility that's been opened up to servicers. But by no means is the servicer off the hook. This is they, they will eventually have to make good on these on, on any borrowing that they're doing through this pass through. And the consumer 100 percent is going to be expected to make these payments at some point. And, and right now, the you know political or you know, whether it's politicians or the media, they really haven't painted a full picture. I mean, they basically have come out and said, you don't have to make your payments. But the truth of the matter is, yes, that's true for a period of time and it won't impact your credit during that period of time. But the minute that that forbearance period's over, you have to make all your payments at once. And if you can't, now you've, whatever period that you're behind now, you're now eligible for a foreclosure, uh, being foreclosure eligible at that point. So, you know, th there, there's some really big risk here. I mean, consumers are not getting the full understanding. And, and, and like you said, if you don't have enough people to answer the phones or every servicer out there right now is dealing with the same issue, which is how many people can answer the phones at our company and explain this to consumers? Well, if you don't have enough people, then they're never, they're, they're going to apply for a forbearance agreement with, a, with an uninformed understanding of what this actually means for them. And that's where loan originators on the front lines could probably, you know, provide some, some air coverage. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I would say the the message is: look, if if you can make your your payments, you you should continue to make your payments. Um, the 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 intent of the you know the the forbearance programs that are being offered today, which is really being driven, it's not necessarily being driven by the servicers. It's being driven by by Fannie, Freddie, and Jenny. Right. The intent is to is to truly help out people that have a short term need. Um, but again, think about it this way: the the again the assistant the assistance that was announced by Jenny. That's just a way to, to help us finance these cash flows that doesn't necessarily absolve the servicer from the long term risk of default. Right. And if you think about if you think about a government uh, loan that, that goes bad from a servicing perspective, I think the you know, the average cost on that from a cash perspective to a servicer is somewhere between three to five thousand dollars per loan. Wow. And so. The, that which comes back to the large, I think the larger issue, while this is definitely a step forward, I mean, it's a huge step forward. I will say that had, had Jenny not come out with that announcement, I mean, there was, there was no way the federal government couldn't step in because there is, there is no sum of money, right. That would from a, from a private capital standpoint that would have been able to survive like what's yeah. happening now from a forbearance standpoint, but so it's a good thing. But there is still this long-term question around government lending in general around um, what it means to to to, to servicing and the, the financial risk you're taking, which is why I think you're seeing, um, you know, a lot of lenders pull back from it. Yeah, today in Inside Mortgage Finance, they highlighted um, a couple of different situations, but you know, anywhere from lenders uh, raising their minimum credit score on government lending to 620 or 640 to uh, they they had they had highlighted lenders moving in as high as 680. Um, obviously, different lenders are, are, are sort of tiptoeing around this because there's certain lenders that are more government um, heavy than not. And, and, and obviously, if they have loan originators that depend on that, that, uh, those products and those credit buckets, it's going to be disruptive to their business model. Overall, as we go through this over the next couple of weeks, and if the report uh, on CNBC today is correct, it, at the Fed basically saying that they could see 45 plus million people uh, lose their jobs uh, as a result of this uh, crisis and, and unemployment rise to over 30%. If those estimations are, are accurate and, and, and the likelihood of default that would follow that is, you know, I mean, obviously during, during the, the financial crisis, unemployment never reached more than 20%. So if, if we talk about 30%, defaults are gonna be high. I mean, there's, there's not, there's, that's inevitable. So with that said, you know, what is, you know, what, what are what, what are lender what, what can we expect of lenders over the next three to four months as these reports come out and and uh, you know how, as far as government lending goes? So um, man, that is uh, I, I would say that to answer your question directly, you can expect people to further tighten. And, and the way I think about it, 
you know, I went through the the 2007, 2008. Were you were you old enough to go through that? Did you go through 2007? <laughs> I, I did. I, I was only on the origination side, so I didn't know all this stuff that was going on on the back end of the business. Yeah, so I was uh, I was unfortunate to be one of the companies that went down early on, and it's a great company. It's a very sad thing to go through. But the one takeaway that I I took, you know, from from that was if you if you look at what happened through that crisis, there were lenders that did not react fast enough. It was different. It was Alte, right? That was driving, and it was the you know, the, the, the subprime market. Um, and there's lenders that, that weren't able to pivot fast enough away from the product. And they ultimately got stuck uh, uh, with, with, um, with a large number of loans that were just suddenly overnight um, illiquid, you know, and that's, so it caused a lot of companies to fold as a company I was working for was, that was the result. Um, and so I think you're seeing the same thing now with government loans. I think you're, you're seeing a scenario where, uh, and I don't want to be doomsdayish, but I I will say this: like I I even though it was a very painful thing to go through, 2007 2008 was very tough. You know, uh, going through a bankruptcy like that and seeing what it did to to the employees, of the company, and the families, my friends. It's just it was it was heartbreaking. Um, it was also a very good experience because I personally never want to go through that again. And which is why you know Home Point was one of the first to come out with overlaying you know, and raising the minimum FICO on government, I think that the faster we as an industry can can react to what's happening. And again, I want to be careful here. It's unfortunate because I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, it's funny because I've been, I've been taking a lot of um, heat lately from my peers at home point because I'm typically that I'm the production guy. Like I'm the guy that wants to push the <laughs> work grow. And, and so now it's like, everyone's like, where did, you know, where did this new fill come from? Like, what is, what is this all about here? And it's like the way, I think about it now is like we're we're not a production company we're we're a risk risk company and our our goal needs to be um to ensure that the, the safety the security the long-term financial stability um of our employees and to preserve uh the liquidity right that we can preserve for our customers in the market and i think the the best way to do that is to is to react quickly uh in the areas that are likely going to cause further liquidity issues and I think government lending is is that next alt a that that we saw you know cause the the, the crisis in 2007 2008 so, so with that said um, and, and it's funny because that's the same conversation that I've had with with risk managers and people that are that are on this side of the business um, if we do see the spike that is expected in April and defaults or forbearance agreements if we do see unemployment spike, what can loan originators in May expect uh, of government lending? Further tightening. Yeah, I think you're going to see. And if you look at the default curves, the 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 default really happens at 660 and below, right on government, which is why you've seen some people just say we're going right to 680. Um, and so I think that you're going to see lenders will continue to raise um, their their minimum FICO. They'll overlay things like DTI. And some lenders in, in many cases may just pull out government lending in general. And, and the reason isn't because, again, I'm the production guy. I want to do as many loans as I can. And I love government. And someday we will be in the market as a whole. We'll be back into government lending. But but right now, the signs are in every every indication that, that government is becoming more and more illiquid. You know, and it's it's being driven by the fact that that as a as a lender, as a servicer, it's almost impossible to assess what the financial risk is to your company. And so no, no smart business leader is going to put their company at risk by saying, I'm going to continue to, to, you know, originate and acquire loans and products that, that I don't know how to value and, and might be caught in a situation where I have a whole bunch of loans on my balance sheet that I can't sell. And overnight, you know, you have a liquidity crisis and you go out of business. That's, that is, that is the conversation that probably every company, is having or at least should be having right now. How, how does that, um, you know, as, as a, as a uh, company that not, not, not home point, but there's a lot of companies out there that cash flow their business off selling servicing. I mean, that's just a part of the, uh, part of the, the business model. How do they deal with these times where servicing values have been essentially marked to zero in some cases, servicing values that as of, you know, uh, January, February, or even December were, you know, you know, we're valued at 100 to 125 basis points. Now that that's valued at zero. How, how does that impact them? And how do they get through this period of time? 
So, I mean, I think there's an offset to that and that because of the capacity constraints in the industry and what's happened with the Fed stepping up and buying um, more product, it has expanded margins, right? And so basically what's happening is, is, is the, the value of governments, and you did a great, by the way, I, I appreciate it. I watched your, your thing on LinkedIn the other day where you kind of walked, you had your whiteboard and you walked through, you know, how, how servicing is valued. And it's really simple. It's all right. If it's likely to prepay, if meaning if if rates are likely to go lower, right, that makes it worth less. Um, because why would you buy something, a cash flow or an asset that is going to immediately run off, right? Or and or if uh, there's any chance of default increasing, right? And you're you're to your point, you're seeing both of those kind of things play out where the market is such that you know it's likely that we're going to see further stimulus that will reduce rates. Um, there's uncertainty around the default, and so as such you know, pretty much everyone is valuing government servicing um, at zero. And so um, I think to answer your question, the opposite to that is, all right, on the flip side, you have so much volume and, and very limited, limited capacity as an industry to handle that volume. And so you're seeing margin expansion that is that is offsetting that, you know, a, a little bit. And that's some way that people are rationalizing, continuing to do uh, government business. The, the issue that you're going to have specific to the pass-throughs is they're heavily reliant on other companies to buy that servicing. And if that if that dries up and over time you see, you've already kind of seen a lot of the, the servicing aggregators, the, the people that do co-SU through the cash window, the large kind of, you know, REITs have sort of pulled out of that, of that business. And so if you see that further dry up, there's a lot of risk because what can happen is as an aggregator, as a, as a pass-through lender, these, these lenders that are selling their servicing up is if at some point they don't have the ability to do that, now they're sitting on a whole bunch of government loans that they can't sell. They're not set up to service. That's that's not going to be a good situation for those types of companies. Yeah, I think I think that's the biggest uh, area of, of risk in the market right now is the fact that those players, um, because I, I had I had some of those CEOs of those companies reach out to me last week and say, you know, Ginny, some of the moves Ginny's going to make will bring buyers back into the market and. And that's not what we're hearing. That's not what we're seeing. Is what we're seeing is those companies already have massive exposure to the government lending uh, market and 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 the risk that that poses over the next couple months with defaults, and they've completely gone on the sidelines. Um, Lakeview completely uh, went on the sideline. Yeah. Um, so if they go on the sideline and they're not buying government loans from the companies that you're talking about, which are basically mortgage bankers that that you know close fund. With the expectation of selling uh, the servicing uh, pretty pretty quickly after originating the funding those deals, if the buyers of those loans go away, then unless those companies have the financial wherewithal and the, and the ability to stand up a servicing platform, which most of them don't, they're really going to be in a lot of pain um, because it's it, it's they're they're going to have to pretend to be something that they're just not, which is a servicer. That's exactly right. And that's that's what you saw in 2007, 2008, except it wasn't government lending. It was it was non-agency is overnight. Yeah. You had, you know, all these companies that had originated a whole bunch of the product with the expectation that there would continue to be liquidity in the market to to sell that product off because they did not have the infrastructure from a servicing perspective or the capital uh, to be able to retain um, the, the, the asset. You're going to see the same exact thing, I think, um, on the government side. Unfortunately, one, one of the questions that has been asked a couple of times is, hey, um, you know, doesn't FHA insure or Jenny don't aren't they insuring the losses um, of these loans? Um, but but realistically speaking, a, a bank or a servicer, nobody gets into, you know, lending money with the expectation that their losses are going to be covered. They want to generate profit and that's not covered through any of these, you know, facilities that are being stood up. Yeah, well, there's there's two components to that. There's, so one, there's the timing of it, right? And so, so yes, they they insure it, but as a servicer, specifically on government, you're having to carry those losses for a very long period of time, a year to, to in some cases, two years before you're able to actually recoup um, the 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 amount of money that you lost. And the other aspect, and I think there's actually there was actually dialogue in the um, Ginny announcement that came out where they're going to start debating. You know, kind of how this works because part part of the issue is there's there's an expectation around certain things that you have to do perfectly when you're when you're servicing a loan that's in default and if there's any misstep um and keep in mind think about the volume right the, of of this that's coming down the, the the pipe and how 
servicers are going to be able to handle this and, and their ability to do things perfectly, right? When they're dealing with unprecedented levels of, of default, if there's any misstep, then you, you forego part or, or all of, of the amount that you could, that you could get back, which is why if you look on average, you know, on a defaulted loan, you're never really made whole. You're, you're just minimizing, you know, most of the loss you're, you're yeah. seeing in on average, you're losing that three to $5,000. And and that doesn't, I, I, from a loss perspective, does that account for operational, uh, you know, investment? Because I would imagine, you know, anybody that's servicing, you're going to have to hire bodies to answer phone. Totally. You're going to have, it does, no. I, I think there's a lot of intangible things to that, right. When you're dealing with some unprecedented spike <laughs> of, of defaulted, that, uh, that that honestly, you know, would, would add to that amount for sure. So we'll, we'll pivot here a little bit um, and, and kind of focus on uh, another subject that's probably the biggest uh, storyline uh, for the last two weeks. And that outside, uh, biggest storyline in the mortgage industry is margin calls. Um, margin calls have absolutely uh, suffocated lenders, and and right now it's a it's 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 on the tip of everybody's tongue that's on on the uh, in the capital markets of mortgage bankers how how unprecedented are the is the pressure related to margin calls over the last two weeks never seen this this is insane yeah and it's uh it's not um it's not oh, any one company is 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 right now able to escape this and basically what's going on is um I mean, if, if you think about how kind of mortgage banking works, you're, you, when you're when you're locking loans as a lender, you're naturally through that taking a long position on mortgage. And then you're you're how hedges work is you're offsetting that that volatility, right, of um, you know, market volatility, the mortgage backed security market by taking a short position on um, uh, TBAs or to be announced right securities. And so that's typically how that's how most every lender um, protects their the risk of the volatility. The problem that you have is in a scenario where, I mean, if you go back just like a week and a half, two weeks ago, you had Fannie two and a half sit like, you know, trading at like 98 and change. And now just as of today, they're up to, you know, 105, you know, so you have like literally in like a week and a half, two weeks, you've seen the the spreads tighten and you've seen this, this, this massive swing, right. In, yeah. in, in, uh, in how the, you know, the different coupons and whatnot are priced. And, and there's no, there's no company right in on the face of this planet that is able to effectively hedge that. <laughs> and so, and so how that works is all right. Well, when, when you go from, from a fanny to an ab at 98 to 105, that's moving the money into your short, you know, your short position. It's moving the, 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 uh, I'm sorry, it's moving the money into your long position. It's moving the money into the fundings which means you're getting these massive margin calls from your, from your hedge. Now you eventually, as a lender, you eventually make that money back plus whatever your margin is. Assuming the loans close. What's that? Assuming the loans, those loans close. That's exactly right. So there's a three to five week delay from when the loans uh, close. And then you're also in an environment where you have massive, you know, unemployment spiking and you have risk of, of potentially, you know, loans falling out at a, at a faster rate than, than was expected. So all this is leading to, you know, massive margin calls um, by, uh, you know, the broker dealers. So, so originators are having to outlay just this unprecedented level of cash. And, and there is this bridge period of time for the next three to five weeks that, that the originator won't get it back. But there's also layered on top of that risk of, of additional fallout that could, that could change the economics of your business. It's a really interesting thing to watch. And so the, um, that's, I'm, I'm sure you saw the NBA letter that was on uh, CNBC this morning and all that. So they're, the, the hope, the goal, you know, NBA has gotten involved in this. I know um, the agencies are pushing as well. But the, the problem is you have the broker dealers are regulated like everyone else. They're regulated by uh, FINRA and, and uh, SEC. And, and they don't currently possess the ability, you know, to give any sort of a, a margin holiday to originators because any anything that's uncollected over $250,000, they change their capital ratio. And now for every dollar they don't collect, they need to have $2 of capital in the bank to offset that. So it's just it's this weird sort of conundrum where you have lenders that it's probably more than likely a short term issue and they're going to get the cash out of their pipeline when the loans fund and, and liquidity won't be a problem because of margin calls. But there's a three to five week period of time where people are trying to figure out how to make these margin calls um, while still, you know, honestly being solvent. I mean, it's a it's a it's a massive issue within the industry right now. Massive. And, and from a perspective of like, you know, just historical precedence is, you know, we all have, you know, all lenders have essentially a pull-through ratio. 
So, you know, you you have this head margin call. If your pull through ratio is 80 percent, 80 percent of the loans that, you know, were subject to this margin call will close and you have 20 percent of your money that's exposed. In this situation where we're talking about the reason why this is such a big deal is because rates have improved so much and pricing has improved so much. So there's this question of will consumers close on the loans um, because rates have improved? Maybe they, they shopped around. Maybe they got a better deal Two, loss of employment. So that's that's real. People are losing their jobs and the ability to close is an issue. So when the loans don't fund one way or another employment loss or the customer went somewhere else, that's just a cash loss. The, the lender. Cash loss. So yep. you know, if you have a hundred billion, do- excuse me, if you have a hundred million dollars in margin calls, thirty percent don't close. You're losing thirty million dollars in you know cash. Yeah, that that that's exactly right. As you you as the originator, you've paid out the cash uh, through your margin call, right on on your on your hedge. And if the loans that you have in pipeline don't close at an expected level, you will that cash is gone and it's a complete loss. And so I guess the moral of the story is uh, for the sake of our industry, the health of our industry is incredibly important that our partners and, and everyone is, are highly cognizant of pull through uh, and, and really trying to help their lenders manage that. Yeah. And, and as, as uh, you know, we, we've seen some announcements here since last week, multiple wholesale lenders have um have made some pretty big uh, uh, changes to their lock policies, and, and there's been uh, there's been posts today of of lenders requiring loans to be in underwriting or approved uh, through underwriting to to, to lock a loan. Um, there's lenders that have said that have made changes that require a loan to be clear to close for a broker to lock a loan, and, and this isn't just broker. There's also uh, retail lenders have had the same announcements. Um, you know, is that something that is strictly related to the margin call issue or is that something that everybody is 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 right now is making adjustments based upon where rates are going? Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's uh, I would say it's not necessarily related to the margin call issue, more about um, more related to people's ability to hedge. Right. And so it's the the volatility, of the market and the unknown around the pull through. I think lenders, many lenders are taking the stance of, all right, if uh, if I just shorten my. Right, because if you say, "All right, I'm going to delay locking the loan until the loan CTC or the loan's file approved," then you only really have to worry about covering, you know, maybe a 15-day period of time of volatility, right? Versus if you're letting people lock on the front end, now you're having to cover a period of time that's maybe 30 or 40 days, right? Because the you know, loan has to go through process, and so that's a that is a sign of um, it, many lenders. There's not one lender out there, and so I'm not saying one's better than the other that are choosing to to, to say, "Look, we we don't know how to." how to really hedge this. And so we're going to simplify what we're doing and reduce our exposure until things calm down. So um, a couple of questions that we have from brokers uh, here. Uh, one, one of the questions is, is it reasonable that after forbearance, borrowers could potentially be reported 120 days late if they can't pay the payments in uh, the forbearance? So basically, uh, customer enters into a three-month uh, forbearance. Month four, they're out of the forbearance agreement. Um, mortgage lenders expect the servicers expecting four payments for the three months behind plus the new payment that's due. They haven't been marked late because the forbearance uh, pr- gives them that coverage. But if they don't make all four payments in the fourth month, they're going to be marked late a one times. So, I mean, is that a is that a one times one twenty? What, what does that look like? So I'll be honest. I don't know technically, and we can we can get that answer to you, so you can respond to the group. I don't know technically how that works from a reporting standpoint, other than I do know that once the forbearance period is up, the borrower is expected to make those payments. And and how we report that, whether or not it's a you know we report all payments as being late or rolls or some, I, we can we can we can get that clarity to to the group. But it is, I guess, suffice it to say, it is um, an event of default. And so if 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 after the period's up, if the borrower is not able to make their their payments, they didn't they they then go into some form of default, at which point, you know, um, you know, there's other options that will exist for them. You know, we can we can modify their loans. We can do payment plans. We can do uh, there's a thing called uh, deference, right, where you can defer it. Um, but there at that point, it would be considered um, default, which is why it's really important. We're seeing a lot of borrowers are requesting this just because they see their local, you know, their state governor on TV saying every lender needs to give 90 days, you know, forbearance. And they're, they're not really 
realizing that 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 means they they still have to make those payments. I think the the messaging from the media has been has really not done our industry any any um any service here and 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 people borrowers specifically are misinformed and they think that it's 90 days they don't need to make a payment and they never need to make those payments and and the reality is that's just not the case and it's not a it's not a servicer issue it's a Fannie Freddie Jenny issue and so we're we're prescribed you know different rules that we have to follow in in what programs we can offer um and we're following those. We're following those rules. Yeah, I, I think the 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 one uh, thing that I've tried to recommend to to loan originators in all channels, and and even really the um, the leaders of of different mortgage bankers, uh, whether they're retail or, or or wholesale, is it's really important right now that we get out in front of this messaging because the people that have uh, the media and the, and the uh, politicians that have voiced this whole notion of not making your payments, th- their voices are so much louder than any anybody else that the default mindset is turning to not making payments and 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 the reality is if you just think through the the economics of this a it's going to be a major mortgage industry issue and it's 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 one at the end of the day if if consumers aren't making their payments it's going to have an impact on everybody no matter how much government uh temporary government support is in the system at the end of the day money not coming in on mortgages is is going to result in bad things happening um, and then the other thing is, is, is just this other reality, which is, you know, there's an entire investor market that is about to get really hit hard. Investors across the country, um, you know, you have different uh, cities and states that are mandating, hey, if you rent, you don't have to pay your rent. And, and for an investor that relies on the cash flow of, you know, you know if, you, if you have multiple properties uh, coming in, I mean, these these people are about to really get hurt badly because they're not going to have the money coming in. Um, and I, I think it's it's going to and it's going to go into one of our next questions here. It's going to impact home values and it's going to impact um, the way, uh, you know, people put their you know, put their money in the market right now when it comes to real estate. So I'm going to I'm going to give you I got five questions here that we've been asking uh, all the leaders and uh, CEOs from different lenders. Um, so the first question is. Do you believe we will see home prices decline? And if yes, by how much? Oh boy, that's a. I wish I had my mortgage crystal ball, man. I would. Uh, I would love that right now. Um, I here's what I'll. I'll uh, I do think we're going to see prices decline. I don't see how you can see see prices decline. Um, I, I struggle to put to put. And the, the reason why I say that is I think that you're gonna you're gonna see an environment where a large portion of the um, population is either not financially in a position to buy a home that, that, that was, you know, a couple months ago, or just with the instability of, um, of what's not happening they're they're, you know, they don't want to, they won't want to buy a home. And so I think you're, you're going to see a, a scenario where uh, uh, despite the fact that we've, we have shortages around the country from a supply standpoint, I think the, the demand is going to fall off a cliff and, and, if you just think supply, demand, you know, economics, I can't see how that doesn't impact prices in the short term. Um, that said, I do think that that I, I am going to continue to be an optimist that I think that at some point there is a recovery, um, whether or not it's a V-shaped recovery or, or maybe, you know, a U-shaped recovery. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But if you just look at it, it, you know, before this whole thing started, the economy was relatively strong you saw wages were going up you saw um specific to the purchase market there was a huge issue around inventory which was which was keeping prices high and i i don't see that that changing i think that, that once we get through this you're still going to have a a massive shortage of homes in the u.s which is going to create a, a balance between supply and demand that 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 forces you know that creates upward pressure on, on prices but short short term i just i don't see there being any way home prices don't go down <laughs> it's just, uh, that, that's been the general consensus right now it's just a matter of how much yeah what is the biggest risk to the mortgage industry at this point and how do you mitigate it <laughs> okay i mean it's it's uh it's liquidity the, the, the biggest risk is liquidity and i think it's as we've discussed on this call it's is to there's a short term risk that really is only you know maybe two to three weeks that have to do with 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 hedging and 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 some companies, um, based on their capital structure, are choosing to 
to mitigate that risk by changing their lock policies and try to limit it. Um, and, and other companies are are, are not. Um, so short term, I, I have to imagine that that the industry is going to feel figure out a way to deal with that because if you look at what's on the other side, even if you see pull through go down, I still think that by and large every company out there is is uh, uh, net net would be in a good position, right? Sure, your net of the margin calls and their pipeline, and 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 you know as long as their pipeline is able to fund out, I think that that you know short term that's that's going to sort itself out. The long-term issue is government lending. And I, and I, I equate it to what we went through in 2007, 2008 with non-agency. I think that, that um, it, there is a slow bleed going on right now. I, I chose to, to, despite, I mean, I got a lot of pressure from our salespeople and, and it was not a popular move. I chose to, to aggressively move to, you know, uh, uh, putting overlays on government because I think that that like you saw in the last financial crisis, which you know, this is not a financial crisis, but unfortunately it could turn into one. Um, the companies that that survived um, and prospered were the companies that were 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 very proactive at at, uh, at mitigating that risk. And the way you mitigate it is you you got to slow the volume, if not shut it off. Well, we just, I, I, there was a uh, it was an IMF today. Um, Impact uh, shut down all new. Uh, volume for the next two weeks, which is basically what you're saying is you have you have a couple choices. You, you you try to slow it down, so you slow it down by you know shrinking your credit uh, box uh, by adding margin, so you're providing higher rates, which we've seen lenders uh, do. And then then there's if those things don't work, then you just shut it down, and that's kind of what you're right. saying. That's right. That's right. What is your number one priority right now? Um, num- number one uh, is uh, is is making sure our employees are are, are safe, healthy, and then um, and and then preserving the you know their fi- their financial ensuring their financial security, right? And that's kind of I know you had Willie on a couple a couple uh, days ago, but the way we think about it's number one the employees and, and making sure they're safe and healthy. Number two, uh, preserving operational integrity, which kind of speaks to this, is making sure that. As the market's changing and we see these risks, we're proactive in mitigating them, and we're ensuring the health of our company, you know, and the longevity of our company, you know. And then number three is is positioning such that you know when this does turn, that we're able to 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 maximize, you know, um, uh, the the opportunity to be able to support our, our customers in a way that that hopefully makes the makes the the rebound a little faster. Um, but number number one is definitely, uh, and I'm, pr- I'm I'm actually really proud of this. I mean, it's it's uh, it was an interesting week. This was I guess two or three weeks ago at this point. You know, we we were fortunate in that we already had a, a good chunk of I think maybe thirty five percent of our employee base was uh, was already working remote. So we had kind of the baseline infrastructure to allow this. But within like three or four days, we had ninety one percent of every you know employee working remote. And then we have like a like six or seven percent of people that are coming in and cycle in and out. And then there's three percent that are critical functions that have to come into the office. But um, it's really been heavily focused on making sure that our employees are uh, you know in a safe and healthy spot. I'm gonna break this up into two, you know, a, a and a B. So how long do you think this lasts? And let's separate that as health crisis as one, and then I think there's going to be some type of hangover in the mortgage industry that lasts beyond the health crisis. So how, how long do you think these two things last? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, uh, I, I, this pains me to say this cause I just like really, uh, want to get out of my house. <laughs> um, but I think we're going to be, I think we're going to, if you just look at what's happening around the world and what other countries where they're at, you know, and, and, and on their curve and how far ahead they are other than the U S I mean, I, I, I cannot see, the social distancing piece ending within the next three months. I mean, I think this is going to be a June or July thing. Um, and then I think as it starts to rebound, I think you have another few months after that where now people are trying to digest how to, how to kickstart the economy again and, and, and what groups of, of people start to go to work. And I don't think that just happens like that. I think there will be this kind of phased, you know, a, a approach where things start to, and so I think it's, it's a three to six month um, uh, issue or event from a health perspective. In terms of the longer financial impacts, it's going to be 12, 18, maybe even two years. I mean, and the reason why I said is like, look at um, 
look at like the last natural disaster we had, which is a good proxy is the hurricane we had down in, in Florida. And there was like a few 17, I think you had the, yeah. the hurricanes that went through uh, Florida and then Texas and all that. And, and that is, that had ripple effects from a, from a, from a servicing standpoint um, that lasted 12 to 18 months where, where we were trying to work out, you know, same kind of same exact process. You originally had forbearance plans and then those forbearance plans led to, you know, people that, that just financially were in a rough spot and we had to provide modifications and, and work them through the unfortunate, you know, default that comes afterwards. And so I think that is given the scale of what we're dealing with here, that's, that's going to be something that could be 12, 18, 24 months. What is your most optimistic prediction? Ah. <laughs> now I'm going to put my production hat on, right? Um, uh, I mean, you know, okay, so it's all, all like, I, I cannot, I, I really try to not watch the news anymore because it's like just infuriatingly, like it just stresses me out. But I did see something today that was encouraging around how they're, they're talking about you know, if they can get these tests out where they can measure, they can um, test for the antibodies, right, for the, for the virus, and they can start understanding the people that have actually had it. And, and I do think that, uh, you know, part of me wants to think that the U.S. is, 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 uh, is able to handle this better than, than, you know, the optimistic part of me wants to think that, hey, we are innovative, we can figure this out faster. And, and I think if you, if you kind of boil it down to this, like the faster we can understand who's had this virus and we can get them back to work, the faster the economy recovers. And so if there's some sort of, you know, between testing and whatnot, um, a way for us to understand that in mass and people start going back to work quickly, I mean, maybe we get through it, you know, uh, in the next few months and you start to see things return back to normal by just, just given, you know, then the other side, I mean, watching the news and hearing all the doomsday stuff and the unemployment figures, I just don't know how you recover from 30 some percent unemployment in three months. But I'm going to say three months. How about that? <laughs> all right, that's a good one. And here's, here's the last one. Uh, obviously, uh, there, isn't, there isn't one person that I know that's in mortgage banking um, that hasn't said to me multiple times, I've never seen this before. This has never happened before. And these are people that have 20, 30 years experience, and there's a lot of never been seen before uh, conversations happening. What has been the biggest learning lesson for you over the last couple of weeks just going through this and, and, and you know, things changing very quickly um, and liquidity being tested. Just uh, if you, if you had to say one thing that you've learned, what is it? So um, I guess, I guess a couple of answers. So, so yeah, I've been in the business 25 years, never seen anything like this. And so uh, I'm definitely in that camp as well, but I'd say the biggest thing that, that has really um, uh, humbled me is just how, how resilient our people uh, have been. I mean, just this, if you think about all the change that people have had had have had to digest over the last you know three weeks to a month, it's it's really an incredible amount of change. You're asking someone to go work from their home where their kids are now uh, home, and in many cases need to be homeschooled, and and uh, the the uh, the fact that we're still operating at the level we're operating is like will forever change the way I think about how we run our business, meaning. Uh, you know, I think that there's some benefits to the work at home kind of thing. And, yeah. and, and I think that, that I'm just, I'm so proud of our people and uh, really thankful of, you know, the, the larger lending community and our customers. Cause I think that, that uh, in this time of crisis, people are coming together in a way that, 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 um, you know, it, it humbles me and it's, it's pretty cool to see. I, 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 I definitely agree with you. There's, uh, you've been on the calls. Willie's been on the calls, but we have, we have, uh, we've had calls. We've had text message threads. But you know, CEOs from retail lenders, uh, wholesale lenders, servicers, um, people that are competitors that have just, you know, kind of put, you know, put their uh, their guns down, put their war paint down, just you know, been very right. collaborative and focused on you know, understanding uh, what the problems are and sharing and, and getting through this. And I, I think that's a really big deal because to be to be straight with you, there hasn't been one call that I've been involved with or one communication where one person hasn't contributed something that other people didn't have on their radar and it got on their radar and it became um, something that they were able to get ahead of. So, you know, I, I've been trying to do my best to work with the loan originators. You know, there's even, there's been posts today throughout the day, you know, hey, I had this loan that was with this lender. And they just change. They add an overlay, and they're not going to close the loan. Um, and, and I think the, the the thing that I would 
just really, really uh, try to convey to everybody is that nobody is doing anything that they're doing um, because they want to. We saw it in the non-QM space. I think the non-QM space was a little bit more brutal in how quickly people felt it because when liquidity dried up there, it was it was realized within like a week or a couple of days. Right. Uh, in, in government lending and agency, it's, it's happening, uh, like you said, it's, it's a little bit more of a slow bleed and it's happening at a slower pace, but it is happening. And, and right now it's, you know, it's, it's something that we're going to have to deal with and just trying to make everybody understand that this isn't intentional. This is just, you know, at some point, lenders, uh, independent mortgage bankers have to make a decision. Do I want to move forward with something that could kill me later? Um, do, how big of a chance or how big of a risk do I want to take? And, and it's not, uh, it's, it's a right. painful decision. Not fun. I totally agree, but I do, I do echo this and it's been, uh, it's been refreshing to, I mean, I'm, I'm almost on a daily basis talking to my peers at, 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 you know, at, uh, at competitors and everyone's just really come together and we need to, I think we will get through it faster if we continue that. No one benefits if no one wants a company to go down or, you know, we, no. there's more than enough loans to go around. We, we really are all in this together and we need to support each other and be positive. And, and I think if, if we do that, we'll get through it faster. Agreed. Well, Phil, we got, you gave us almost 50 minutes. We, uh, we appreciate you. Obviously the broker community is well aware of your contributions with, you know, when you're a caliber with the reconnect program and the customer for life program at uh, home point, you've been a, a massive, uh, you know, evangelist for the broker community and advocate for, for independent loan originators. So we all appreciate you and, and the team at home point. So thank you for the time. And, and we appreciate you guys. My pleasure. Thanks, Anthony. Have a great day.